Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we are going to be reading True Park Ranger Horror Stories. I hope you enjoy them. Also, I apologize that this video is going to be a little bit shorter than my other videos, but I have been a little bit sick here lately, and if my voice sounds different, that is why. But that's also why this video is going to be a little bit shorter, and I do apologize for that. Hopefully I'll get to feeling better soon and can get back to making my longer videos as normal. So, without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. A few years ago, my friend Tez and I set out on a great American road trip. We were going to drive from New York to Los Angeles, zigzagging through the country for six weeks. We were both in our early 20s, pretty broke, and as my mom had been a long-haul trucker, I suggested that to save a ton of money, we should sleep in the back of our hatchback. It was a pretty cozy setup. We bought some blankets and sheets at Goodwill and cut one of them up to make curtains. By the end of the first week, We'd gotten so we could set up camp in about 10 minutes. Luggage moved to the front, curtains up, bedding laid down and out for the night. We slept in parking lots, free campsites, rest areas, basically anywhere that it seemed safe and semi-legal. There was never a night after the first night where we felt scared until the last week of the trip in Arizona. We were near Flagstaff and had gotten pretty used to our routine, we didn't go on a set schedule and would never drive more than three or four hours a day. No destination really in mind, outside of a few must-see landmarks. We'd drive to places we found the night before on Google and take suggestions from other campers, locals, and people we met. We'd also gotten very good at making friends. We went to Denny's with a group of rednecks we met at a campsite in the back of their pickup because I got hungry and I overheard them saying that they were going to go. We met an 80-year-old cowboy who took us out drinking and taught us to line dance at a country bar. Hope you're still kicking, Grandpa Mac. Played the guitar with some musicians in the middle of a thunderstorm. Got fed breakfast and dinner by tons of campers who invited us to hang out with them. Spent the 4th of July with a family who basically adopted us into their campsite. The grandma gave us some weed candy. Basically, every encounter we had with a stranger was a positive one. This night didn't look to be any different. We found a free campsite on Google and drove up into the woods, following our GPS. We were pretty far out of town and something seemed a little off when we pulled up to the campsite. There was one RV parked and two cars further up in the trees. We pulled up near the RV and a man opened the door. Tez waved hello and he just stared at her. His expression was completely blank. Then, as if she hadn't said anything, he just slowly closed the door again staring at us the entire time. Figuring he just wanted some privacy and thought we'd be obnoxious, we pulled further down the road and found a flat spot to park the car. Instead of our usual routine of setting up camp immediately while it was still light out, we grouped around for a while, smoking and laughing and taking dumb photos of ourselves. Tez pointed out a campfire further down the campsite, and we decided to go be friendly. We'd met so many cool people in the previous five weeks by just going up and offering beer or just chatting, so we wandered over. Near the campfire, there were two men, the owners of the cars that we'd seen earlier. They seemed friendly, and we sat down to chat with them. They were drinking and smoking, and we sat down and had a beer with them. One of the men seemed pretty off, and we came to find out that the two of them didn't actually know one another. The older man was definitely on some sort of drugs. He was spinning in circles and talking about UFOs. However, he seemed harmless. This left us chatting with the younger man, who claimed to be a former park ranger. He was handsome and easygoing, and we spent several hours just chatting about our trip, families, and everything else. Then he started talking about the bear. He'd seen a bear earlier in the forest. Tez didn't believe him, and he pulled out his camera to show her the photos of the bear. It was very close to the campsite 
and we both were a little freaked out. It wasn't unheard of for one of us to get up to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. So the idea of a bear hanging around in the night spooked us. The ranger just laughed, and then his expression changed completely. It's hard to describe, but his voice seemed somehow cold. He said, If you get out of your car in the middle of the night, it's not a bear that you should be worried about. I kept waiting for the laugh, or for him to nudge Tez with his elbow. Jokes on the foreigner and the city girl, right? But he never did. I laughed awkwardly and made a dumb joke about serial killers in the woods. My friend laughed as well and joked about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We moved on to another subject, but within five minutes the ranger had come back to it and was talking about grabbing us from our car in the middle of the night. No matter how we tried to steer the conversation away from serial killers, he kept latching back onto it. The older man was high as a kite at this point and was staring at the stars not talking. We'd just awkwardly laugh and sip our beer and try to get the conversation going somewhere else. Then the ranger stood up and walked towards the cooler and get another beer. At this point, it's pitch black out, and I can't see anything outside the circle of light from the campfire. The beer cooler was outside of that circle. Suddenly, there's a red dot in the darkness, and it took a moment for me to realize that it was a camera. The ranger was holding a camera. He had taken a photo of us. I could see the screen on the digital camera light up. Now, it wasn't odd for people we met to ask to take pictures with us. My friend Tez is gorgeous. Dark hair, blue eyes, kind of like a young Megan Fox. And we were both friendly. People like having pictures of themselves. It was an entirely strange thing to have this person taking a photo of us, without asking, or even indicating that that's what he was doing. We were both staring at him like a deer in headlights at this point. But instead of realizing what he's doing is a bit weird, he checks his camera, adjusts some things, and takes another photo, this time with the flash on. No asking us to smile, no proposing a group photo, and no explanation. After this photo, he comes back to the fire and sets down. Not a word said about the picture. At this point, me and Tez are mutually freaked out. We make up some excuse that we need to go set up our campsite and we nope the hell out of there. When we need to leave, the UFO guy smiles and says to have a good night. The ranger, however, looks at us with a smile that doesn't reach his eyes and says, Be careful out there. There's more than bears in the woods. Every hair on my body stood on end. I wasn't alone in my discomfort either, because Tez laughed a response out and pulled me away from the campfire towards our car. We rushed back to the car, which we only found in the dark by referencing the RV and jump in the front seats. My friend Tez is all but hyperventilating. Why did he take pictures of us? I was shaking. I responded. I read that serial killers sometimes warn their victims. She stared at me for a second and locked the doors. Do you think he just took victim photos of us? We both freaked out. She's in a full panic and turns the headlights on in the car. I immediately yell at her to turn them off because now he knows exactly where our car is. God knows why, but that is the only night we'd not set up camp. We didn't need to tear anything down, so we just put the car in drive and floored it out of the campsite. As we got onto the dirt road, we realized that the ranger was walking towards our car with that same cold expression. One of my best friends from college was a geologist major that ended up becoming a park ranger in the southeastern United States. We haven't spoken in years, as is the case with age, but I remember about eight or nine years back he was telling me about some old married couple that he had recently helped out. He had seen them come to the park several days in a row and found out that they were visiting from out west and they had gotten engaged there decades prior. They had been searching for a spot that they'd taken pictures of where he popped the question, but they were having trouble finding it. After looking at the pictures and figuring out roughly where they were trying to get to, he escorted them in his vehicle, then hiked with them to the spot where he thought it would be. They found it, and he left them there and went back to his station at the entrance. He said he got a weird feeling once he got back, 
and felt like he needed to wait to see them whenever they left. Well, once it came time to lock up at night, he still hadn't seen them leave, so he reported it, left his assistant to wait at the shack at the entrance, and went back to where he left them. He found both of them lying down, spooning along the bank of the river. Neither were alive. He called the cops, went through the nine yards, and went home. The police were able to disclose to him their identities, but weren't sure anything else initially. Later, he learned that the wife was terminally ill with cancer, and they had both unalived themselves by ingesting some sort of chemical-slash-pill combination medley. They had chosen to do it where they had gotten engaged at. My buddy wasn't torn up about it. He was obviously sad for them dying, but he said that he thought they hadn't asked for help earlier because they didn't want anyone to think that they helped kill them. Just to be clear, I am not in the forestry service, but I do have a related story. My cousin is with the forest service in the Montana slash Wyoming area, and I decided to go up there with her to literally test the waters. She does hydrology and has to ride out to the middle of nowhere to test streams and snow runoff to ensure that there are no contaminants. So I thought that sounded fun and wanted to do a bit of a tour with her. We were going to have to camp out there for two nights. So we packed up all of our gear and saddlebags and saddle bundles and started out. The first day and night was amazing. Beautiful scenery and amazing air quality. It really is so peaceful out there. I love that area, and I wish I got to go up there more often. Anyway, we started out on the second day and my cousin said, You want to see something weird? Of course I said yes, so she led me on a bit of a journey into this tiny little ravine. We ended up traveling about two hours away from our actual path that we had laid out. At the very end of this fold in the land, she dismounts and tells me to get off my horse too. We tie them up to this gorgeous little clearing, and she tells me to follow this tiny wildlife path and to bring our little rechargeable radio. It's one of those that you can plug in or wind up, and it also acts like a lantern if you really need it to, but that kills the batteries very quickly. I do. Out in the middle of effing nowhere, there is a huge coil of wire sticking out of the ground. The wire itself was not weirdly large, like some buried transmission wire, but small, like 10 or 12 gauge wiring for a house. It trailed off into the brush and trees, so naturally I decided to follow the thing out of curiosity. My cousin trails behind me as I do, and this wire, after coming straight up from the ground, is strung across limbs of trees, then back to the ground. Then it snakes around some rocks and finally dead ends into an outlet. That outlet is mounted on the side of a desk. It looks like a school teacher's desk from when I was growing up, with a metal base and a pseudo wood slash plastic top thing. No chair, no building, no anything. Just this outlet and this desk. I'm staring confused as all hell at this desk in the middle of a forest when my cousin takes the radio, pulls out the cord, and plugs it into the outlet. Then it let up and started blaring static. The wire was being fed from somewhere. Now, the place where we were had no road access, no buildings for many miles, and no other people around. And yet, there was a live outlet. Weirdest thing I've ever seen. No spooky jump scares, or bodies, just one lone powered desk in the middle of the woods. I wish to God that I had taken a picture of it. I'm a park ranger, and I work at a pretty remote desert park. This happened before I got there, but the other rangers I work with were there. They went to do a patrol during summer, which is our off-season, at one of our seldom-used campgrounds. On a patrol, our maintenance ranger found a burnt-out car in one of the sites. The desert is a weird place, so he just calls the sheriff and waits. Sheriff arrives, and it turns out there's a body in the driver's seat with no arms and no legs, just a torso and head, burnt to crisp. The sheriff's just marked it as a self-unaliving and removed the vehicle. 
we're close to Mexico and we do get a lot of illegal drug traffic. So I guess they don't even bother trying to solve those. Super sketchy. I'm an ex-forest ranger, and we had a group of frat boys making way too much noise. We came by twice, and at the second stop, I told them, this is your last warning. Not only is it rude for other campers to be so loud, it's exceptionally dangerous. Everyone knows that local mountain lions are attracted to loud noises at night, and these ghost cats, as they are called, can creep right up on you without you hearing or seeing them. Whatever you do, don't leave your tent tonight. If you hear anything, don't make a sound. We went back to the station, grabbed the lion pelt from the interp center, and the night vision goggles. The head ranger had to blow what was left of the budget at the end of the previous year. Once they were all in their tents, we crept into the campsite and made fake lion tracks everywhere. We set up the lion pelt propped up over some sticks. The other ranger got out the PA and from a distance started doing fake lion calls, slowly getting closer. I pulled the jeep forward like we were arriving on scene and got out, turned on my mag light and illuminated the silhouette of the lion pelt. Because I was moving quickly, the shadow of the lion appeared to be moving. At this point, the frat boys were losing it. Jim, the other ranger, shouted, stay in your tents, followed shortly by, she's coming around at us. And then there's another one. And finally, let's get out of here. At that point, we turn off the flashlights, grabbed the lion pelt in the darkness, and jumped in the jeep and sped off. Just after sunrise, they started peeking out of their tents. Nobody was brave enough to get out until about 8.30 when they saw all the huge paw and claw prints everywhere they really freaked out. Your tax dollars at work. I'm not a ranger, but I used to be in a group that's somewhat like the scouts. So we spent a lot of time in the woods and some weird stuff happened often, but most of the time it was easy to explain. One thing happened though that to this day scares the living crap out of me. I was a leader for the age group of eight to 10 years old and we were out on a camping trip. It was the first year we stayed on that terrain and it was huge. Normally, we tend to explore the majority of a terrain before the kids arrive, so we were aware of any possible dangerous spots to avoid. This time, it was impossible. Every camp, we have what we call a night game. It's usually a scary game in which the kids have to complete several tasks while the leaders scare the ever-loving crap out of them. Obviously, we had one too during that camp. We masked up as monsters and hid out in the woods close to the checkpoints that they had to pass. While running in between checkpoints, I found an open stretch of forest with little to no foliage, so it was ideal for chasing after them. There was no real room to hide besides behind trees, so I couldn't use my flashlight or they'd be able to see me for miles away. It was dark, like the unsettling kind of dark that plays tricks on your eyes, and you start imagining things that aren't real. During my stay there, I saw a shadow that was around my size running past me a few times. I couldn't see it very well, so I just assumed that I was imagining things because nothing was there when I turned my flashlight on. The game was nearing its end, and I saw the shadow again. This time, I could see it vaguely standing near a tree not too far away from me. I thought it was one of the other leaders, hiding to scare kids, and I decided to go over there as it was about time to go back. I aimed my flashlight towards the tree, and while getting closer, I noticed that there was indeed someone standing there dressed in what looked like a torn burlap sack and had their head covered with a few white plastic bags that looked like they were all tied together. I started to feel pure dread. Something felt really off. I asked if everything was okay, but they didn't respond. The only thing I heard was this weird sound that sounded like someone knocking on wood. Nevertheless, I went a bit closer until I was about 10 meters away from this person. The knocking sound turned out to be that person smacking his head repeatedly into the tree, and I noticed that he looked like a male. He was barefoot and his arms and legs were covered with crusted mud. 
His hands were in a weird cramped position. I was convinced this is just one of the other leaders pulling a prank. So I told them to knock it off. He slowly turned his head and started walking towards me. Something inside me just told me to run. It didn't matter if it was just a stupid prank and I ran away scared for nothing. If this wasn't a prank, it felt like I was in serious danger. So I ran as fast as I could. I heard him running after me, but I didn't want to turn around to look as I'd probably run into a tree. I arrived back at the campsite and every single person that could be dressed like that was already there. He couldn't have gotten there before me. And if they did, they sure as heck didn't give me time to change into their regular clothes. Still, I told them, and they gave me a good scare with that. They just looked weird at me, thinking I was trying to scare them, and we left it at that. Next day, I wanted to go check it out. Who knows, maybe some weirdo ate the wrong mushroom and might be out there dying from hypothermia. I took someone else with me just in case, and there was nothing but endless trees. We arrived at the tree where I saw the person banging his head, and there was a dead, skinned, decomposing rabbit nailed to the tree. We called the cops. They looked around quickly and brushed it off as a prank from another scouting group, or some kids from the nearby town and they just left it at that. We didn't notice anything weird after that, so it probably was a dumb prank. But seriously, some people have a messed up sense of humor. I was the lone recreation ranger in a small district in southern Idaho. The nearest town from the guard station was about an hour and a half away by car. After moving into the guard station, solar power was not working, and I hadn't slept for about a month due to various factors. Bats in the cabin, something walking on the deck at night, the woods there always had an eerie feeling to them, unlike the southwest Ponderosa forest that I was used to. About two months into the seasonal job, I started to hear something walking and scratching on the deck at night, perhaps even on the door. Now, this district was known for its badgers and beavers, so I didn't think much of it. When leaving the cabin at night, I always had an eerie feeling like I was being watched. One night, I was returning from my grocery run. I always went on Tuesday nights, and I had a bad feeling. At the time, I did not have my shotgun in the vehicle. After stepping out of the vehicle, I looked to the right of the cabin, about 50 feet from my front door. All I could see were two eyes about three and a half to four feet in the air. To say I freaked out was an understatement. I started yelling, get out of here. But the eyes only crouched down and inched closer. At this point, I could tell it was a large animal of some kind. Definitely not a coyote. I tossed a piece of firewood in the general area and the creature leaped back a bit but did not make a sound. I tossed four or five more pieces and the creature still inched forward. At this point, I fumbled with the keys. Of course, the solar power was out again. I managed to get inside and grab my shotgun. Technically, you're not supposed to have guns in government housing, but who the F lives in the hills have eyes backcountry and does not carry? I went outside. The creature was a bit closer. I still could not get a good look with my crappy headlamp loaded shotgun and continued to throw pieces of wood with one hand. Finally, the creature walked back into the brush. That night, I drank about four IPAs and slept with my shotgun. In the morning, the trail crew came up and we found mountain lion tracks all over the porch, rocking bench, and compound leading back to the creek. After that event, I always heard the rocking chair move and someone or something walking on the porch, but I never found any tracks after that point. Considering that it was always muddy up there, it was not weird to find tracks. I've been stalked by mountain lions before and never had that eerie feeling like I did in those woods. I've been a ranger for the United States Forest Service for almost 15 years but this takes place about three years after I joined. We were getting calls about a lone wolf with a collar on hanging around campsites. Weird, since wolves aren't known to be in that area. But when you work in the field long enough, you start to realize that anything is possible. 
No calls had mentioned violent behavior from the animal, thank God. I departed from the station around noon to check out the places that it had been sighted. Wandered around for about three hours. No further calls during that time. Until I took a break for water. I sat down, had a snack, drank some water, and was getting ready to go again when the thing was about 20 feet out, trotting near the tree line. It seemed friendly and had the collar, so I whistled to it and it came over to me. Getting a closer look, I could see that it wasn't a wolf. It was huge, but it was dark and didn't have the right body structure, though I could see why it would be confusing from a distance. I radioed in and reported that I had the dog with me, but as soon as I said I'd bring it in, the dog took off, like he was playing, to see how far he could get me to chase him. Typical dog behavior. I went after it, and I swear it was a game of chase for at least five minutes as we steadily ran through the forest. Please don't go running through the woods unless you know the area like the back of your hand. The dog finally slowed down near a rock bed slash creek area and started pacing around a spot. I drew closer and didn't see anything off at first. Then I noticed it. The overgrowth had almost disguised what appeared to be bones. I called it in immediately, and another team was sent to recover the remains. When I went to retrieve the dog, he was just gone. But honestly, it wasn't a priority at that point. He was friendly enough, and I figured we'd catch up with him later. The bones were identified as a teenage male's, died by a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. He had been reported missing in the area long before I became a ranger and there'd been pretty much no hope of finding him. I spoke to his mom on the phone. She called to thank me personally, and she asked how I'd found her son. I mentioned the black dog, then thought I'd said something wrong, since there was a pause on her side of the line. After I gave a couple of details about the dog, she quietly explained that her son, who struggled with making connections, had sunken into a deep depression after the death of his best friend, the very dog that had led me to him. I think I spent the rest of the day stunned. I continued to be in disbelief in a way, but I know what happened. In truth, I never entered the federal forestry program, although it was my college major. At the time, I went through the college program it was during the transition to armed forest rangers. Better than 70% of the marijuana grown in the United States is, in fact, grown on federal land. These squatters who choose to grow illegally on federal land are quite adept at setting warning traps, and worse, along the way to deter visitors. It depends on the size of the operation, but some go to deadly lengths to prevent unwanted guests. So in my day, they were just transitioning to arming the forest rangers, these are different than unarmed park rangers, to be able to defend themselves or use lethal force in the apprehension of a suspect. Having said that, it is highly likely with over 30 states legalizing medical and, in some cases, recreational marijuana, that it is likely those expectations might have changed. It was also at the beginning of the new requirement of wearing hard hats in the forest, an OSHA regulation. It is detracting, albeit life-saving, some conifers put on cones that are just over a foot in length, have a girth of better than 12 inches, and spurs sticking out of the end of the pedals. They can be deadly falling from 400 feet in the air and landing on the top of your head. A hard hat was inevitable. My most frightening moment while in the forest was also my most spiritual. I was seated about 100 yards from a grave. It was behind me, and in front of me I could see the silhouette of trees waving in the wind. It was a late twilight, and the shadows mixed with silhouettes to lend an eerie late summer evening feel. For a period of time, I was able to feel the spirit behind me. I could feel the forest around me, and felt as one with the entire earth. But I could nonetheless strongly feel the spirit of a person buried behind me. It wasn't a malevolent feeling. It was peaceful and very real. I always loved being up in the woods of Washington. The cold, frigid air cuts through my clothes and makes my bones cold. 
the kind of cold that makes your soul take a deep breath. I muster my strength upon a steep incline through these woods. I keep on telling myself, one more step is all I need. When you know you're in a tight spot, you always encourage, or for myself, I lie to myself. Helps me keep going. I turn around as I finally reach the campsite and welcome the achievement of life that I'm at. The sun is now going down and I pitch up my three-step pop-up tent. I begin to crawl in my half-made tent like a dog runs to its kennel after being awake all day. I take my baby wipes out and begin bird bathing myself. Even though I am freezing, I know sweat is all over my body, especially the amount of layers that I wear currently. Jeans off. Jacket off. Sweater off. Socks off. Shorts off. I feel relaxed and refreshed cleaning myself off after this eight-hour trek through the woods of Mount St. Helens. I open my map and begin to chart my next destination in dreams of Mount Rainier after Mount St. Helens. Crack. I pause and carefully peek out my tent liner. I don't see anyone or anything. I lay down enjoying the nature around me and begin to drift off. Crack. I set up and open my liner and I see a face. Heart pounding and this pale white man runs across my tent into the tree line. I begin looking through my bag to find bear mace and my camping axe. I clutch it with white knuckles as hard as I can and I step out of my tent. I turn around and see a ring of men in black robes around my campsite staring at me. I run into my tent and phone for the park rangers. The rangers pick up and I scream help. I'm being stalked. There's dozens of people around me. Please get here as fast as possible. I stay in my tent staring at my phone with every minute passing by I become more fearful. My breathing is speeding up. With every breath anxiety is shaking my body. All I hear is... Who phoned for the rangers? I bolt out of my tent to see two rangers on four-wheelers armed with hunting rifles. I look, and no one is around us, just me and the rangers. I hop on their four-wheeler, and one hour later I get returned to their office. I get handed a bulky camera, and I cycle through the photos. Pictures of me throughout my hike were taken. Distant shots and pictures of me, even urinating outside. Till this day... I won't go to the woods near Mount St. Helens. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. And again, I do apologize for this being a shorter video. Hopefully I can get over this sickness soon and get back to my normal, longer videos. Good night, everybody, and have an excellent sleep. I will read to you in the next video.